A thousand years ago, the Karadadoi were one of the dozen tribes living in the hill country between the Southern Sea and the Patanian Woods. Over time, they subjugated their neighbors, forcing them into a confederation of city-states. Perhaps they were slightly fiercer than the others, or just lucky. Or perhaps it was the one tradition that set them apart. The Kataroi had no kings. Ever since the hero Ekaron slew the tyrant Sapigos, the institution of the monarchy was banned. In theory, at least. There was an assembly of free citizens that met occasionally, a senate of elders that sat permanently, and during a dire emergency, supreme command would be invested for a short time in the person of an emperor, a title that back then meant little more than the right to lead an army. From their heartland in the hills, the Kataroi began to spread outward. As they did so, their political traditions, which were never written down, began to change. Soon, the army was in the field more years than not, and gradually, the emperors stopped retiring at the end of their campaigns. The senators, meanwhile, moved to the conquered provinces and acquired great estates. The capital moved from place to place, and the assembly of the people was called wherever the emperor desired. In practice, this was usually an army camp where his veterans could be relied upon to shut down any opposition. The question of succession was always a potential crisis. Usually, the emperor nominated an heir, the senate ratified his choice, and the people, as in the army, acclaimed it. But this did not always happen smoothly, and then the succession was settled on the battlefield of a civil war. Twenty years ago, a general named Arnikos donned the purple mantle worn by the emperors and placed a laurel crown that was not a crown on his brow. His military record, his diligence in rooting out corrupt and inefficient magistrates, and the confidence he could inspire with a single speech made him a popular ruler. He also had the gift of being everything to everyone. He rose to prominence as a man of the people and the army, but he also worked closely with the landlords and led them to believe he might restore the power of the Senate. He praised the Karadian Republican ideas as the pinnacles of human achievement, yet married the daughter of a petty king from the lands east of the empire to shore up an important trade route. Formed an elite bodyguard of foreign mercenaries loyal only to him, and turned a blind eye when cults began to worship him as a sacred monarch. He spoke of a revived Karadia, but kept his counsel on the details. There was one shadow hanging over the realm of Arnikos, his reluctance to choose an heir. It was though he was casting around for someone who grasped his vision, but never found one. Traditionally, emperors looked in three places for their successors, their family, the elders of the senate, and the upper ranks of the army. His one child, Ira, was a daughter. There had been ruling empresses of Karate in the past, but Ira had a wild and irreverent streak. Her right to the rule was championed by her mother, Ragahia. Arnikos' foreign-born wife. It was good for the children of the emperor to succeed their fathers, her partisan said. If we unite in loyalty to the emperor imperial family, the civil wars will stop. A faction of powerful nobles under the honorable but stiff-necked aristocrat Lucan demanded that the senate choose the next emperor. We understand politics and law, they said. Return through the old days. Return power to us. Meanwhile, the wild popular Garius, victor of wars against Batania and the Azurai, let it be known that he expected his veterans to be allowed to acclaim a new emperor. The corruption of the powerful saps our strength, he told his men. Let you, the soldiers, who bleed for this land, choose its rulers. The time was running out. Arnikos was getting older. He needed to make some sort of decision, and soon. And then, returning to his palace in the southern town of Lycarin, after his latest victorious campaign on the borders, he asked for some time alone in his chamber to nurse a splitting headache. When his guard checked in on him a few hours later, he was lying dead in a pool of blood. Immediately, Lucan. Lucan convened a gathering of senators in his power base in the north and had himself declared emperor. Garius, campaigning on the Batania frontier, stood before an assembly of his soldiers who cried out for him to don the purple. Imragahia emerged from the palace and addressed the thong that had gathered at the reports of the emperor's death. She raised before them the slain emperor's robe, drenched in his blood. The crowd cried out that she should be made empress, that the emperor's family must rule from this day on, and that she must take vengeance on his murderers. Although who exactly that was at this point was mostly a matter of rumor. Civil war again loomed, and this time three equally balanced and determined factions the eager to fight. It looked as though it might be more terrible than ever. The Empire is the last faction, or rather, the last three factions to be looked at in the series. It is based on the classical tradition of Greece and Rome and their medieval successor, the Byzantines. There was a lot of change in over 2,000 years of history. Obviously, although the Roman Republic became a de facto empire under Augustus, remnants, like the Senate, persisted to the 1300s. Meanwhile, 
What's stated as a bureaucratic state, with prefects and governors appointed for very short terms, evolved into a de facto feudalism by the 11th century with Byzantine magnates rolling fees and having military obligations like any other count or duke in the West. The rules of succession, meanwhile, were never set in stone, which suits our purposes in the game very well. If it has his or her eye on the purple, there are a lot of different ways of gaining legitimacy. The waning years of the Roman Republic, the time of Caesar, Antony, Octavius, Cleopatra, Cato the Younger, and Cicero, have had a huge impact on Western political thinking and are a major inspiration for the literature, so we've drawn a few characters from the era. But Byzantine rulers like Justinian, Alexios Komnenos, who brought the empire back from the brink, are equally fascinating personalities, as are the ruling empresses like Zoe and Irene. That is it for part one of the empire. Part 2 will be covering the military aspects of the Empire, and that video will be released on a later day. If you'd like to see more Banalore videos, consider checking out my playlist. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.